is Angelo. I am seven years old and I live in America. I'm Alex, I'm 10, and I'm from Fresno. We're gonna go do some football training with Angel Tree. My name's CJ. I would like to be a professional football player and make lots of money and help homeless people. Children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty. They're nine times more likely to drop out of school and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. I know for me personally growing up, I didn't think that I had a, a male figure that cared about me because my dad wasn't around. He was locked up, he was incarcerated, so I didn't feel like anyone cared. So I felt like I can do anything I wanted to with, with no consequences. But having a program like this let, it lets me know that there are men, there are other people outside of your family that actually do care about you and you can't do anything that you put your mind to. My favorite part of the football clinic is obviously the kids. And just the interaction that you get with the boys and the opportunity to kind of share your insights and what you've experienced and your love for this great game and then also kind of sharing the love of Christ and, and being a positive role model to these kids. We have to have a servant heart and even though these kids are going through some difficult times, um, it's great to come out here and serve them and let them know that somebody cares about them. I came from a really poor background out of New Jersey in public housing and it was great adults like this who gave me the confidence to get into sports and so to be able to come out and invest in these kids is just a really a great honor for me and to see so many good players from so many good schools and old coaches coming out and being able to be out here with my kids is just a great experience. I love you saw not only in football but in life. It was just uh, mind-boggling. It was amazing. They um, helped us out way more than most coaches would try because they want us to improve with everything that we do. Welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today. Our vision here at New Hope Community Church is to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. Part of that Angel Tree football camp that you saw earlier is doing that. We get a chance to feed Jesus to students who have their parents that are incarcerated. So make sure you sign up today and be a part of that awesome camp. Also, if you're a guest with us today, we want to welcome you. We want to say thank you so much for coming today. If you would, uh, fill out that Connect card and let us know that you're here. Uh, we would love to give you a little bit of info on some of the exciting things that are happening here at New Hope Church. We just want to let you know about all the exciting things that are going on at New Hope Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. Hola, me llamo Kylie. Tonight is our Mexico Mission Celebration Night, and I'm here to invite you. Five o'clock? is when we have free tacos and service starts at 6. Come join us for worship, testimonies, and just to hear about how God moved in our lives. We'd love to see you there. Franklin Graham is bringing his Decision America Tour to the Valley on May 28th. We want you guys to be involved and be a part of this. So the first thing that we need some help with is we need some prayer counselors. So if you're interested in that, this Thursday at Campus Bible Church from 6 to 9, there's prayer counselor training. Sign up today. Be a part of this awesome event. Man, it sure feels like summer. Parents, if you have 4th, 5th, or 6th graders who are interested in going to summer camp, there's an informational meeting April 29th after church in the Jam Center. We hope that you'll come and join us if you have any more questions so we can learn more about summer camp. On Saturday, May 5th, men, we got something for you. It's the Mighty Men's Movement Conference here in Fresno. You don't want to miss it. Tickets are on sale at mightymensmovement.org. If you put in the discount code Church New Hope, you get a discount. So men of New Hope, let's go to this Mighty Conference together. Hey everybody, May 3rd is the National Day of Prayer. As New Hope, let's join with America to pray. There will be a prayer rally at 12 p.m. at Clovis City Hall on May 3rd, and then at 6 p.m. at Fresno Pacific. Join us for a night of worship and prayer. We'd love to see you there. 
Thank you so much for coming today. We're so glad that you're here. If you have a prayer request, just fill that out on the back of the Connect card and us as a New Hope staff would love to pray for you on that. Thank you for coming. We hope that today that you experience Jesus in new and refreshing ways. Great job. Thank you, Chris. And team, for putting that together, I want to highlight two things tonight, 5 o'clock, right out here in the pavilion. Man, all the tacos you can eat. And then at 6 o'clock, uh, our high school team is going to be sharing testimonies and video of what transpired down in Mexico during Easter week. So they would love to have you come back, find out more about, uh, about what went on there. Uh, May the 3rd is National Day of Prayer across the United States. And uh, we will be honoring that uh, across from Clark Intermediate School at Clovis City Hall at 12 noon. Uh, if you can make it on your lunch hour or if you are retired and you've got the whole day, please come and join us. It lasts for about 45 minutes. Seven or eight of us as pastors will be participating uh, in that event. There's always some uh, excellent worship music and then uh, seasons of prayer as we pray for our nation. Um, I want to connect two things just briefly, and I want to highlight this. We have the National Day of Prayer on May the 3rd, then we end the month uh, on Monday of, uh, of Memorial Day with the Franklin Graham Decision Tour, all right? Uh, it's a one evening stop. Uh, they are doing about eight or nine cities up and down the California coast. Last year, they did this in the east. Uh, they've not asked for a dime. This is just something, uh, even before Billy passed away, they felt inclined to do an evangelistic tour up and down the state. Uh, there are two things that are happening, uh, I think, evangelically in uh, our nation at the same time. Um, Number one, um, evangelicals are getting a bad, a bad rap, and I'm not here to talk about who you vote for. You've heard me many, many times. I just simply tell you, go vote. I don't care who you vote for. Be engaged in the process. But evangelical Christians are getting somewhat of a bum rap at the now, saying that if they voted for President Trump, they're giving him a moral pass. Um, I want to make it very clear. As an evangelical pastor, I'm not giving President Trump a moral pass. He needs to confess his sins for his poor behavior. That's not a moral pass. Whether I agree with some of the uh, things that he has done politically, because we can align sometimes politically with somebody or not politically doesn't mean we give them a pass or a condemnation. Uh, it is no different with the immorality of other previous presidents that we know about. They need to confess of their sins. And we as God's people need to pray that there's a point of repentance that would come to them. At the same time, then Franklin Graham, because he does speak out sometimes politically, uh, he's, people in the church say, I'm not going to support him. What he's going to do in this community on the 28th of, of, of May is preach a gospel message just like his father did. He is going to let people know that Jesus Christ is their Savior and they need a Redeemer. Jeremy Camp is going to be there doing music. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to invite friends or neighbors from a community who probably would never darken the door of a church but would go to the fairgrounds for music, all right, and some food and some other activities that are going to be there. I am a firm believer in the events like Billy Graham Crusades. Uh, our daughter accepted Christ at the Billy Graham Crusade. All right, I have other friends and family members who never would have darkened the door of a church who went to an event and they found Jesus Christ. And so we have the opportunity to join together, whether we are Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever brand you want to put on your political persuasion, we have an opportunity on May the 3rd to join together our hearts in one common purpose, and that is to pray for our nation and to pray for those who govern our nation, to pray for those who are going to be running for the opportunity and the privilege of govern our nation, and to pray for God's leadership in all of those areas. Can we do that together? I think that is something that we can do together. And so May the 3rd is important. And I think May the 28th is important for a, a revival doesn't break out across an entire nation at one time. It is like throwing a rock into a pond. Okay, it hits one place and then it has a ripple effect in other places. I sat in a meeting this week where a group of men and women gathered together for the purpose of planning a celebration on November the 7th, which would have been the 100th birthday of Billy Graham. Billy didn't quite make it to 100. 
but we still want to honor the man for what he did, the ripple effect he had uh, in this nation for about 60 years. And as we sat there together, a group of folks from all over Fresno, church leaders and community leaders, talking about the difference that God can make in a community. And the Billy Graham crusade said this to our executive team when we had the crusade here in 2001. Billy himself said to the executive team, in all of the crusades I've done literally around the world, I've never seen such unity as I have in the city of Fresno. Now that's a wonderful compliment to have paid to us. We need to see that same kind of unity functional today. It's 2018, it's 17 years after that crusade was here. We need to see that same kind of unity in a national day of prayer and an evangelistic event which is going to address the spiritual needs of our community. So whether you can attend those events or not, at least be praying for them for God's will to be done. And if you can, show up at both of those events because I think it's a, a, a key moment in history for our community and for our nation at this particular time. That was not scheduled. Um, all right, well, the other thing that I wanted to highlight were some prayer requests which are on here uh, that are not in your bulletin. David James, David Wave over there, so people put a face and a name. All right, David James' son uh, lives in Hawaii. He's in the hospital. He's in a, a medicine-induced coma as they try to deal with an infection that is in his system. And so uh, things are pretty serious for him, so we would appreciate you remembering to pray for him. Robert Hutchinson Sr., our, our former youth pastor's dad, part of our church for a long, long time. He lives now up in the mountains out of the Reedley Sanger area. Uh, was rushed to the hospital, Selma Hospital, uh, night before last, and yesterday morning had an emergency appendectomy. Uh, the surgery went well, he is home from, uh, from the hospital, and uh, he is recovering, so please pray for him. Jack Parker, uh, Greg Parker is usually sitting right out about here, and his wife Shelly is usually singing up here with our worship team. We've been praying for his dad for several weeks. He was an ICU at Veterans Hospital. Uh, he has gone home under some palliative care. Uh, his future is probably very, very short. Uh, but Jack Parker, for the first time this past week when he was still in the hospital, uh, allowed me to pray with him. He's always avoided that in the past. He would say, not now, how about later? Never wanted to talk about spiritual things. When I walked into his room this past Monday, he said to the two nurses who were in there giving him a breathing treatment, oh, here comes my pastor to pray for me. That was an open door that he's never ever given. And uh, so uh, I said, well, let him finish the treatment and then we'll visit for just a few minutes. When they finished the treatment, I knew he was very tired and we couldn't visit long. And he said, Tim, pray with me. And I said, okay, Jack, but as I pray for you, there's something really important I need to know because it determines how I'm praying. And uh, I said, Jack, have you ever accepted Christ in your life? You've put this off for a long time. As long as I've known you since I was in the fifth grade, you've postponed this. You don't have much time left to postpone. Have you ever prayed? He said, Tim, I prayed that prayer many years ago and I put it on a shelf and I ignored it. But he said, over the last few days in here, I've taken it off the shelf and I've been praying again. And so I said, I'm gonna take that as a positive sign that you've invited Christ in your life. And he said, I have. And so that was a wonderful privilege to be able to hear those words from him. He is home right now. His son said uh, there was a different attitude about his dad in the last service, and so I'm grateful for that. So continue to pray for Jack as they go through this. We have several others who've been in the hospital this week or had tests this week. Steve Dean, Richard Heath, Kent Hames. Kent's here looking better. Uh, and um, I want you to be praying for our friend Ray Steele, part of our church board. You know he's had cancer. He's had a brain tumor. He is a walking miracle, all right? Literally, he is a walking miracle. Um, people with a kind of brain tumor that he has, and I have had a father-in-law and a, a dear, dear friend, uh, they didn't make it six months, and we've had Ray for years now. Um, the treatment is, is not shrinking it anymore. 
And so um, important decisions will be made over the next probably weeks to months uh, about what might be next in his treatment. So please be praying for Ray as they go through that. Cami Molinari had uh, major surgery on Friday and uh, her dad, Jerry Molinari, also part of our church board, has a surgery scheduled for the 15th of May, but he needs it sooner if possible. So they're waiting for an open window there. And Bernie Krause uh, gets the results from his tests about his esophageal cancer on Tuesday. Day. So please be praying for all of these folks and the others that are listed in your bulletin. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us today as we have our tithes and offerings. Uh, we have 35 women up at Women's Retreat today. Uh, they're coming back this morning. We have 16 of our high school students up helping out at Hume Lake Christian Camp. They are not there for camp. They are there to make the experience of other high school students who are up there for camp go well. They are serving food and cleaning cabins and uh, doing chores and helping to reduce their cost of summer camp uh, up at Hume later. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, we love you. We thank you for the life that you share with us. You have us here in this world for such a time as this. And I pray that we accept our responsibilities as being your sons and daughters on earth. That because your son 2,000 years ago died for us and rose again from the dead so that in the person of the Holy Spirit he could come live within us and reveal himself to the world in the 21st century. I pray we are letting you be seen in us as we work, as we play, as we walk the halls of hospitals, as we walk for our physical health, our neighborhoods, that we pray for our neighbors and take advantage of opportunities you provide for us. As we worship as we are engaged in the day in and day out activities of our communities, I pray, Father, that we are your walking signboards, letting the world know there is a God who lives, there is a God who loves, and there is a God who saves. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. May we recognize the privilege that we have of being your children, but may we not live as privileged people in this world, but may we live as people who recognize the privilege and responsibility of being the recipients of your love and your life and that we are to be a reflection of that to those around us. Thank you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. At our 8 o'clock service, there was a uh, young lady standing in a corner of the pavilion by herself I, she had a pair of sunglasses on. I did not recognize her. But I saw her lingering there. She looked very, very sad. I walked over to her and introduced myself, and she said, oh, I know you, Pastor Tim, and she took her glasses off. And I recognized her. She was the mother of a young man by the name of Hunter. Some of you might remember I requested prayer for their family last August. It's been only about eight months Hunter Lamar was uh, a 17-year-old young man who died unexpectedly. Um, this was his mom. And uh, it's her first time that I've seen her since the memorial service. We'd sent a few cards, made a few calls, but first time I'd seen her again. I have to be honest, there were uh, a few minutes after I visited with her and had prayer with her in the corner of the pavilion and wondered, Wow, Lord, am I supposed to change my sermon for today? If you were here last week, you know what we're talking about today. And uh, it was kind of like the whisper in my head was, um, you think I didn't know she was going to be here today? And so um, we chatted a few moments and she came on in. One of, uh, one of the ladies in our eight o'clock service also took notice and uh, invited her to sit with her, and they sat together during the morning service. I've been thinking about her all morning, and so um, I'm just going to share with you, pray for Hunter's mom, if you would, in the adventure of this week. This was a, a difficult day for her, and yet it's what brought her here. Um, if you weren't with us last week, you have no idea of knowing that we're starting a brand new series. It's called What's Up With Heaven? And we introduced it last week, and we are going to pick up with where we left off last Sunday. We seek to push away over the next several weeks the curtain and to catch a glimpse of what lies beyond this life. 
It's a question I often ask at memorial services. What do you believe is on the other side of death? Can't make you believe anything, but hope that knowing that that date with death is on your calendar somewhere in the future, and it's not always a long ways in our future. This subject of, of heaven uh, ushers in also the subject of death. And sometimes it comes like it did for Hunter when you're still in your teens. If you've worked with hospice, we know that sometimes it even comes in infancy. Um, last week, I asked you all to, remember the experiment last week? Wow, I had no idea how that would turn out. Uh, if you weren't here, I gave out my cell phone number at the beginning of the service, asked people to text me their question about heaven. Because over the next several weeks, we want to attempt to address most of those important questions. I will say I got a few very unimportant questions during the week. Most of them were right on target. Some of you were playing with me, and I know who you are. All right? <laughs> uh, but I got a lot of great, great questions. I still had questions coming in yesterday. So some of you took time to think about your questions before you sent them in. Let me, uh, let me highlight quickly, because I know some of you are curious, what some of the questions were. We shared a few last week as they came flying in during the service, but I've kind of grouped them uh, in a cluster of about 15 questions. It'll probably be the key ones that we'll look at over the next several weeks. But here, here's one of the questions. Is heaven a real place, or is it just a figment of our imagination? How will life in heaven compare with our present life on earth? Now, that was a thought-provoking question. What's the comparison there? Uh, what will we do in heaven? And that one was asked in a lot of ways. Uh, will I have a job in heaven? Will I be assigned a task in heaven? What will be the uh, societal structure of heaven with responsibilities? Will heaven be boring? Obviously, they were thinking about the sermon last week. <laughs> what, what, what will happen to our disabilities in heaven? Will we become angels when we get to heaven? Good answer. Way to go, guys. Um, yeah, I will talk about that at greater length. Is anybody getting cold in here? Okay, let's turn the coolers up. Uh, somebody thought it was warm for a while. So let's, I see some of you getting closer to your loved ones. <laughs> and a couple of you are getting closer to strangers and they're wondering, what are you doing? <laughs> All right. uh, but we often hear uh, when somebody passes away, oh, now I've got another angel in heaven looking after me. No, you don't. You do not want to be an angel in heaven. All right, you and I are God's sons and daughters in heaven. Jesus Christ did not come, live, die, and be raised from the dead for angels. He came for you and for me so that we could become the sons and daughters of God in heaven. Um, angels were made a little lower than us in this creation thing. Um, so we will not be angels, thank goodness. Will a person go to heaven or hell immediately after death or simply be asleep until resurrection time? It's a very thought-provoking question. Again, as we shared last week, um, the question was asked probably 12, 14 times, will there be animals or will there be pets in heaven? Okay, uh, And we'll talk about that. I did tell you last week, to the chagrin of some, there will not be any cats in heaven. Um, <laughs> And that was a joke. I, I own a cat, all right, but you know, cats are so independent, they rule the roost. Uh, Herndon has tried to prove that at, at our house again this week, okay? Uh, he always tries to find ways to outfox us, all right, in things that we don't want him to do. Um, in what ways will believers be judged in heaven? Fascinating question. Um, in heaven, will we recognize friends and loved ones that we knew on earth? How will a heavenly perspective, this is a good one, how will a heavenly perspective impact our life on earth? What will hell be like? Interesting question since we're looking at heaven, but we will talk about hell a little. Why won't God allow everyone to go to heaven? Just a quick answer, we'll talk about this later. He does allow anyone to go to heaven. Just not everyone chooses to go to heaven. Um, I love this question. Will there be food in heaven? 
I, I, I am confident that was a Baptist, all right, in our congregation because for those of us who were raised Baptists, you had food almost every time you went to church or you went to food as soon as church was over, all right? That was the key topic of conversation. What do we look like in heaven? Uh, better. Um, <laughs> here's, here's another uh, critical question. If my relatives aren't saved... Will they be in heaven? Don't answer out loud, okay? Because we have to understand where this comes from. None of us want to imagine heaven without those that we have loved the most on earth. And what, I, what part of my prayer really is about this series is that you and I will catch a deeper appreciation of life after death both a blessing for those who know Christ, but also the catastrophic, catastrophic curse for those who don't know Christ. And I believe the answer to that question helps answer the other question of how will a heavenly perspective impact our life on earth? I think having an understanding, an appropriate, balanced understanding of heaven and hell has to impact some of the choices that we make of how we live on this earth and how important sharing Jesus, not, not our church, not our religion, but our faith and a relationship with Jesus, with those that we love. Will there be chocolate and hiking trails in heaven? fascinating question might not make it to that one where did hell come from why and then, then there was a personal question and I, I didn't recognize the phone number and I haven't put it on Google to find out who it might be but this was a personal question asked towards me why do you believe so firmly and how do you have so much faith that it's real and I hope as we process through this series, most of those questions will be answered. I laugh, I closed out last week's sermon with this story, and I'll use it again today as an introduction to today's sermon. A Sunday school teacher was teaching his class about heaven, a group of uh, probably third, fourth, and fifth graders, and he asked the children at the end of the uh, series on heaven, if I sold my house and my car and had a huge yard sale and gave all the money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And all the kids had paid attention to the lessons very well, and they all shouted, no, no. He said, good. He said, if every day I vacuumed the church carpets and cleaned the bathrooms and mowed the grass, would that get me into heaven? And again, they all yelled, no, no. He said, good. Well, he said, if, if I was kind to the poor and gave candy to children and loved my wife, would that get me into heaven? Once more, a unanimous no, no. Then he says, okay, then how do I get to heaven? And one five-year-old boy yelled from the back, you got to be dead first. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. And that's why no series on heaven can really start without first looking at the subject of death. Three buddies were discussing death and one member of the group asked an interesting question. He said, what would you like people to say about you at your funeral? And one of the guys popped up and said, you know, I would love to hear somebody say, I was a great humanitarian and I cared for my community a lot. The other one said, I would love to hear that I was a great husband and father and I was an example for many others to follow. And the third one said, I would love to hear, look, he's moving. <laughs> he's moving. And that last guy probably captures a lot of us because we would like to think that, that there's never going to come an end to our movement here on earth. But it does. And the Bible gives us really a wealth of information about it if we'll simply take the time to investigate and listen. Sometimes, though, we postpone this discussion of death and eternity and heaven and hell until the very end. 
Jane up here could tell you about that. For those of you who don't know, Jane worked for many, many years. How many? 30? Almost 30 years with uh, Nancy Hines Hospice. Um, I got engaged with them when they were very, very small, and Jane was working there at the time. She wasn't married to that handsome dude sitting next to her when I first met, first met Jane. Um, and I learned so much about the subject of death and dying. Um, probably from the time I started till I ended serving on their board, it was about a 24 year experience that I'd had with them. I started out as a volunteer chaplain when they didn't have anybody, and now I think they have four paid chaplains. And uh, the things that you learn at moments, moments like that with people, but often people would wait to the very end to wanna think about that subject. I guess that was true with the great comedian W.C. Fields. Some of you, that name means something. You have no idea who W.C. Fields is, do you? God, I hate showing my age. Um, he, he, he was a comedian back in my dad's generation, all right? And, and a friend came to visit him when he was in the hospital, and he didn't have much time left. And when he got to the hospital room where Fields was, he saw Fields thumbing through the Bible that, that had been placed in his room. And his friend was so shocked to see Fields thumbing through the Bible, and he says, what are you doing? I've never seen you look at a Bible before. And Fields said, I'm looking for a loophole. And that's what many of us hope for is a, a, a loophole. But I think there's a better approach to it. Billy Graham died recently after 99 years of life. November 7th this year would have been his 100th birthday. I can give you a little uh, uh, inside scoop. There is going to be a celebration, a party thrown in Fresno and Clovis for his 100th birthday. Uh, through Sue BMC and leaders and uh, in the community, uh, we're planning a special day to honor Billy Graham and his legacy. But I think, uh, I think Billy Graham had the right approach to the subject of death and heaven. Don't wait to the last minute. Franklin Graham was quoted at his, quoted his, was quoted at his father's memorial service, these words. He said, for the Christian Death can be faced realistically and with victory because we know that neither death nor life will be able to separate us from the love of God. That's found in Romans chapter eight. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. As the son reminded the crowd of his father, he said, my father preached on heaven he told millions of people how to find heaven. He wrote a book on heaven, and now he is in heaven. His journey is complete. What a way to face death with that kind of perspective. So before we jump off, spending too much time talking about heaven, let's take a few minutes today and probably next week talking about the doorway to eternity called death. Some of the theories that have been suggested of what lies beyond death's door and how death fits into the message of the Christian faith because it has its roots in the Bible. So for the first few minutes today, I'm going to talk about the mystery of death, this, this thing that's so mysterious we try to avoid talking about it. In many ways, death is a mystery. That's why we're intrigued by movies every time they come out on the subject. That's why books are written frequently about the subject, and many of them become bestsellers. Joseph Bailey wrote a book back in the 70s called The View from a Hearse, and it describes the mystery of death this way. It says, we may postpone it, we may tame its violence, but death is still there waiting for us. Death always waits. And the door of the hearse is never closed. By the way, there's no trailer hitch on the bumper of a hearse either. You can't take anything with you. It's just you. This is not a, a movie I talked about it several weeks ago. It's not a strong faith-based movie, but I think it's a good movie to challenge us to think about how will I let death impact me as I live and as I faith death's door. It's a little movie. It was only in town one day. It's called Getting Grace. Go online, Google it. You'll find some very interesting interviews with, uh, with the producer of it. 
Um, again, not, not, not strong on, on, its, on its faith basis, it's subtle. It's about a teenage girl, she's been through radiation treatment, she's lost all of her hair, she's got a gregarious personality. There is, a, uh, there is a funeral home in her neighborhood and one day she goes down and knocks on the door. She wants to meet the funeral director and she wants him to show her everything that's gonna happen to her when she dies. And she keeps popping up. He doesn't wanna mess with her, he finds her a bother and so she ends up hiding in a casket and throwing the lid open when he walks into the room to get his attention. And um, she, she does all kinds of very humorous things. And, and, and with humor, they really deal with a very important part of dying, our fears. And are we going to allow the dying process to make us worse or make us better? And there's a line in there that probably goes over most people's heads. They think they're talking about the lead character. But the mother says, some people get grace, some people never do. There's a deeper theological principle there. Grace has been made available to us so that the doorway of death gives us what we don't deserve, which is heaven. And we don't have to get what we do deserve, which is hell. But some folks never get grace. So today, because death is a mystery, our world has different explanations for what happens when we die. One of the perspectives is called disembodiment. I know that's not very flattering. But it's an idea that when we die, our soul is liberated from the prison of this body. This is probably the oldest Western explanation, tracing its root back to Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. According to this view, the real me is not this body that you see, but it is my soul, my mind, that, that, that non-physical spiritual reality that makes me who I really am. Here's what's somewhat challenging about this view is it's partly correct. There is much more to us than what we see in a mirror. There's much more to us than this flesh and bone. There's, there's the mind, emotion, and will, which from a biblical perspective is what we call our soul. And then there is that other dimension that is the, the image of God, which is spirit. And, and so this disembodiment principle has some roots and truth, but it only goes so far. This approach views the afterlife as bodiless, a disembodied existence, this view has been extremely popular throughout history and it wills incredible influence still yet today. A Time Magazine poll found that 66% of Americans believe that only a person's soul goes to heaven. There's no body there. This embodiment view is what's behind those who believe in ghosts. It's where the paranormal activity comes in. It's ghostbusters and fortune tellers make, make, make a lot of, of, of money because they prey on this, this idea that our loved ones are disembodied spirits still hovering around in our culture today. Another popular explanation of what happens on the other side of death is reincarnation which is the idea that after we die, we are reborn as another type of living being, maybe human, maybe not, but the decision will be based on, any idea? Karma, karma. This view goes back to over a thousand years before Christ and it lies at the heart of Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Reincarnation is tied to this idea of karma, which is believed to be the universe's justice system. You all have heard of uh, the idea what goes around, comes around, and around, and around, and around. That's what karma is, all right? If you, uh, if you come back, um, if you are a human, and you were a criminal, you might come back as an animal the next time. If you were wealthy but didn't live better, you might come back poor next time. If you were poor but you did wonderful things in your life, you might come back rich next time. It's it's a constant changing evolution 
based on your behavior. Karma claims that everything painful that happens in our lives is a direct result of bad things we've done in previous lives. Thus, our suffering is the universe's way of balancing the scales of justice. I don't know about you, but I like the word grace a lot better than I like the word karma. This means that all pain and suffering in this life is deserved. Whether it's the refugees we see on TV, they must have been really bad people in a previous life. Or a 10-year-old who's been abused by her uncle. Can you imagine what they did in a previous life? All suffering is a direct result of bad things we've done, and suffering bad things in our present life is the way the universe settles the score. Reincarnation and karma have immigrated from the east to the west and have been popularized by people from my generation and the one right before me like Shirley MacLaine and Peter Sellers by groups like the Unity School of Christianity and Estera, a group out of Southern California. Recent polls reveal that currently 20%, 24% of Americans believe in reincarnation. The Bible nowhere affirms that reincarnation is true, and in fact, the whole idea of karma goes entire, against entirely the message of the New Testament of grace. Yet belief in reincarnation seems to be a growing possibility in our culture today. Finally, some people believe in extinction. You would think that this idea had been around for centuries, but it really hasn't been. This idea that when we die, we simply cease to exist. Although few people believed that in the past, it's over the last 100 years that it's become a, a more popular and dominant perspective. For instance, the Human Manifesto, which was written the year I graduated from high school, 1973, it states that there is no credible evidence that an individual's life survives the death of the body. Extinction assumes that God does not exist, that matter is the only thing that's real, and that scientific knowledge is the only kind of knowledge that is true. This is why the atheist philosopher Anthony Flew suggests the entire idea of life after death is meaningless since he assumes that life is purely biological which ceases at the moment of death. Atheist Keith Augustine admits, when confronted by the death of somebody close to me or when I contemplate my own inevitable death, I am not comforted by any words of wisdom. Nevertheless, we cannot but place our beliefs on what we want to be true. Although only 13% of Americans hold this view, it has been growing in influence over the past few decades. I often will say at some point at a memorial service when it seems to be an appropriate time, you know, Hunter has given us the opportunity today to think about our own mortality. I'm gonna ask you for the next few minutes to contemplate a question for me. What do you believe is on the other side of death? I can't make you believe over the next few minutes anything, but I hope I'll prompt you to go home and think about a few things. One option is there is nothing. When you die, you just become food for worms, and that's all there is. Then if that's what you believe, live like hell now and don't worry about it. But if you think there is something else, there is a date in your future with a subject called death, then you need to explore what is that possibility and make a decision about it. Extinction. Death. What I want to wrap up with today is to look at the idea that from a biblical perspective, death was not what God had planned for us. What does the Bible say about this subject? The first time the word death is mentioned in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Listen to what it says. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. That's the first time the subject of death is mentioned. Those are the words of God himself. Who's God talking to when he says those words? Adam and Eve. Only two people alive at the moment. God had created this beautiful place called Eden with all of its beauty and its luxuries for them to enjoy. But remember, this was a relational thing between God and Adam and Eve. It wasn't just an environmental thing for Adam and Eve. This was a relational event with God. 
God said, I've provided all of this for you. I want a relationship with you. And so everything in this garden is yours to enjoy, to oversee, to take care of, to tend to. But right here in the middle of the garden, there is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. All the other trees of the garden are yours. In fact, right next to that tree, there is the tree of life. You can eat with abundance from that tree. Just one, one option. Haven't you and I thought through the years, if I didn't have so many temptations, I could be a better Christian? I, I've thought that, you know. They just didn't have so many good things out there, all right, that draw us away. Wow, it would be so much easier. It would have been much easier to have been a Christian if I'd been a cowboy during the cowboy days. They didn't have video games and they didn't have commercials and, 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 and you know, they didn't have all this other stuff. I, all I had to do was rope a cow and, and, you know, prepare a meal. Life would have been so much better. Adam and Eve had one temptation. Only one, a tree with a fruit that said, if you eat of it, that day you will surely die. And what did they do with that one temptation? They ate. And did the fruit, did the fruit cause their death? No, their choice. You see, the choice was this. You can have the whole garden and depend on me every moment of every day for all eternity. You can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you can step into independence from me thinking that I can do better than God can in governing my life. And they chose independence. In English, we want to really emphasize a word. We underline it. We put bold letters on it. We make the font bigger. But in the Hebrew language, instead of doing all that kind of stuff, they would use a grammatical form called infinitive absolute. Um, this is not going to be a Hebrew lesson. But what this does is it emphasizes the verb. To underline and call attention to it, they use an infinitive absolute. And that is what is done in this passage here to draw attention to the verb die. Now, we know the first man and the first woman who did eat of the tree declared their independence from God. We know they did not die physically that very day. But yet the scripture says that day you will surely die. You see, in the Hebrew, death, much like in English, carries with it multiple definitions. Let me highlight those quickly. First of all, there's the death that we call mortality, which puts emphasis on the process of dying, physically dying. Um, 2 Corinthians 4.16 says it this way, outwardly we are wasting away. That's, what's, that's mortality. Um, come, come here real quick, just real quick. You don't have to say a word, just come here. Yeah, 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 just, just come here, okay? Her mortality looks much better than my mortality, doesn't it? <laughs> It's because she's much younger. Mortality hasn't had as great an influence on her body as it has on mine. And so she's experiencing mortality, but I'm experiencing at a greater rate. Does that make sense? I am dying at a faster pace than she is right now. All right, go sit down. You maybe look bad long enough. But there's this idea, all right, that physically we are wasting away. When we have a disease, when we end up with cancer, when we end up with... with, with, with Something as a result even from poor habits like sometimes COPD because maybe we were lifelong smokers. We are, we are experiencing the mortality of our human body outwardly wasting away. The process of mortality began the very day the first man and the first woman declared their independence from God. But death can also describe the actual event of physical death itself, which is what mortality leads to, is ultimately death. Although this didn't happen on that day for Adam and Eve, physical death became the inevitable result of that moment. Physical death does not mean non-existence, but it means a separation of our physical body from our non-physical soul, mind, emotion, will, and spirit. In the Bible, death can also refer to spiritual death, which is being alienated from God. This is what the Bible means when it describes, as you and I are born, physical life 
but dead in our trespasses and our sins. That's found in Ephesians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 2. We have this biological life. We're breathing. Our hearts are beating. But we are deaf to God's voice. This separation from God and spiritual death occurred immediately at the moment that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and stepped into independence from God. The Holy Spirit that God had breathed into them when he gave them the breath of life departed from their human spirit and they were now spiritually dead. And because Adam was spiritually dead, he couldn't pass on to his children and his children to the next generation a spiritual life they did not possess. That is why in the year 2018, in the month of August, I should have a second grandson. I cannot wait to see that beautiful baby boy in my arms. What makes that possible is his physical life. But as I look into those beautiful eyes of my second grandson, I will also know that he is spiritually dead. And it is my son's fault. Ladies, I'm letting you off the hook today. You see, we can't pass on to a next generation what is not in our DNA. You had two men perfect on this earth. The first one created perfect. His name was Adam. He blew it. The second one, Jesus Christ, not created, born perfect. He didn't blow it. And so he became the acceptable sacrifice for all of us who did blow it up until his birth, his life, and his death. Born, but sinless. How was that possible? He had an earthly mother, right? Name was Mary. She carried that birth the old-fashioned way, right? Nine months pregnant. What's the difference between Jesus' birth and my birth? He had an earthly mother, but a heavenly mother. Father. So ladies, you don't carry the sin gene in your DNA. Now, don't misunderstand me. You're still ever bit as sinful as I am because you had an earthly father. Jesus had a heavenly father and an earthly mother and he was perfect and he lived his life in such a way that he could become the acceptable sacrifice for all of our sin. So there is spiritual death. But finally, the Bible says there's this thing called eternal death which is eternal separation from God. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, the Bible says this is our second death. For some reason, I've gone slower in this service than I did in the eight o'clock service. Let me read to you this verse and we'll wrap things up for the day. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire and the lake of fire is the second death. Eternal separation from God, never in his presence, never in, 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 in the sphere of his glory or his connectedness, never in a relationship with him for all eternity. That is eternal death. So as you can see, when God said in that day that they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die, there was a lot to that statement. There was mortality, there was physical death, there was spiritual death, and there is eternal death. Here we find what happened in Genesis is our story too, that somehow in some mysterious way we were present in that first man's declaration of independence from God. The thing called sin entered into the realm we live through and we act and it's right on our heels, this thing of, of sin and death, mortality, spiritually, physically, and ultimately eternally. Somehow our sins, our own failures to live up to God's standards, our own rebellion against God is linked to what happened in Genesis Now, this verse is not telling us exactly how it all happened. It's not giving us a a theological theory of original sin, but it's establishing the link of sin from Adam to us, and the only one who could break that chain of sinfulness in our lives is Jesus Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 15, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. As in Adam, death reigns upon all, so now in Christ Jesus we can all be made alive in him. So this idea of death, it wasn't intended to be natural for us. Though it's become the norm, 
It was never intended to be natural. And that is why Jesus says, if you believe in me, though you what? Die, yet shall you live. How are you going to face death? We'll pick up the rest of the subject of death next week, but let me close with this. It was with my time with Heinz Hospice. I met a woman by the name of Alma Goodman. You remember Alma? She was unforgettable for more ways than one. Alma weighed over 660 pounds. She's the biggest person I ever saw face to face. Alma did not want to see a chaplain. Sometimes they snuck me in covertly. I sometimes came just as a friend. With Alma, though, the day I went, I came as a chaplain. A nurse was with her one day. She was from Fresno EV Free Church, and she was taking care of Alma that day. And in her conversation, Alma said, you know, I might see a chaplain. She called immediately, said, can you come right now? The doors open a little bit. And so I jumped in my car, ran across town. She lived over on the west side of Fresno. I walked into her house. There she'd be back to her bedroom. I don't think she'd been out of her bedroom in months. She hadn't been out of her house in years. She had to lay flat because of her size and because of her breathing. And the reason she didn't want to see a chaplain is because she firmly believed that she had done things so bad in her life, she had such a bad image of herself that she thought there was no way that God could forgive her. I knew I had a brief amount of time. I didn't have time to develop a relationship like I often like to. This was probably a once a once and done opportunity. I really prayed as I walked in, God, I have no idea what to say to Alma, and I walked right up to her bedside. I looked straight down at her face as I looked over her bed, and I said, Alma, who do you think you are? Wasn't the nicest of introductions. She looked at me startled and said, I don't understand the question. I said, I want to know who do you think you are? You say that God can't forgive you, and I want to know who do you think you are? Because the Bible says that Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, said he was the chiefest of sinners. And I said, have you killed any Christians? She said, no. In fact, I haven't known many. <laughs> she had a little sense of humor to her. And I said, then you cannot be the chiefest of sinners. You're not the worst. Paul is the worst, and he got saved. And I quoted John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who believes in him can have everlasting life. I'd never seen tears go this way on a person's face. But she couldn't sit up, so they couldn't go this way. So her tears went this way, and she had a smile on her face, and she says, God can forgive me, can he? I said, yes, Alma, he can. Would you pray and invite him in your life? She did right there in her bed. She prayed. Jesus came in her life. All of a sudden, the, the, the pressure of living, holding on to what she knew as physical life, just there was now a sense of peace about her. I'd been working with Heinz for about three years at the time. I'd learned a few things from experience. I can't document it scientifically, but from my experience, here's what I knew. When I had the privilege of, of introducing people to Jesus and they would pray to receive Christ, the struggle to live stopped, and they often died in a matter of hours. But they probably got two weeks, three weeks. I was told I would probably had a month or two. When I left that room, her daughter was sitting in the living room and said, what, well, what happened with my mom? And I shared with her, our mom invited Christ to her life. And I said, I, I can't tell you this is going to happen. But here's what I've seen happen. When people have peace here, when they know that the death of this body is not all there is, that they're going to continue to live afterwards, they are at such peace. They often go home to be with Jesus right away. Don't be surprised. That night I got a call. Alma had passed away. I got to officiate at her service. I had to actually have f six men come from our church to help because they needed more. She, we almost didn't have the funeral. I don't know if you remember that. The casket that was special order didn't show up in time, and it was almost late getting there. But it didn't make any difference because Alma wasn't there. She was in heaven. You see, it does make a difference the way in which we live and the way in which we die when we have peace about eternity. I don't know why you came today. I don't know what you're facing today. Maybe it's somebody else's mortality. Maybe it's your own. But Jesus has come to offer us peace. He's come to offer us his presence. He's come to make sure we know his promises. I go to prepare a place for you. 
If you don't know him, why don't you invite him in your heart before we walk out of here today? If you do know him, but you carry a fear of death and dying, why don't you embrace him and say, God, thank you. Help teach me more about what your word says. And then keep coming back every Sunday until he finished the series. <laughs> but let's pray. And if you need to do business with Jesus, he's listening to your heart right now. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing Hunter's mom here today. I don't know what that was all about, but I'll trust you with it. There are others sitting in this service today. I don't know the reason that they came, but you do. This may have been a divine appointment and destiny for them. And I pray at this very moment, if there are unsettled questions and there are confusing fears about the future, they will at least come to a point of knowing that grace is a far better solution than karma, that the fact of a risen Savior whose name is Jesus Christ, that the plan from the Old Testament to the New Testament, when we look back at it from this perspective, fits together so well, one man blew it, one man restored it. Father, thank you for your son, Christ Jesus. Thank you for hearing our prayers today. May we walk out of here with a sense of courage and strength instead of fear and abandonment. We trust you with this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Next week, we will look at the Easter story's influence on our view of death.